This is the current federal tax developments for the week of October 26, 2020. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers, presenting again this week from here in Phoenix. And this, we're going to be looking at a few things happening during the week, including an IRS chief counsel advice dealing with the treatment of daily fantasy football league payments. Is this gambling? We'll also talk about a taxpayer who was looking into a problem that arose on when the taxpayer claimed a deduction and the tax court deciding that he had attempted to claim it in the wrong year because he was relying upon an IRS safe harbor. We're also going to look at the IRS's first addition to this self-certification items for late rollovers to retirement accounts. This is the first edition since the list first came out in 2016, and it's going to specifically deal with an issue that's also covered in another ruling, which is where qualified retirement plans are distributing lost assets, lost accounts, shall we say, where we couldn't find the participant to state unclaimed property funds. And the IRS also rules in that case, because that's what they added to the self-certification if you discover that your retirement account ended up in a state unclaimed property fund. We have also added to the requirements that if a plan makes such a distribution to a state retirement fund, that we're going to have to have withholding. We also have a fairly important item that came out this weekend of all places instructions, but it was a comprehensive ruling by the IRS about something a lot of people have been interested in for a while, and that is the IRS's plan to require partnerships to report capital accounts for partners on the tax basis beginning this year. We'll have a case that involved a CPA attempting to reduce their potential liability for having a return filed late and the penalties the client was trying to collect from the firm by claiming that the law firm that represented this, the uh, the client in a IRS proceeding uh, failed to take advantage of all possible defenses to reduce the penalty. And finally, we'll look at the fact that due to an error that occurred on the BSA e-filing site for the FinCEN reports, there's a slight extension of time to file the FinCEN reports if you discover now that you have reports that should have been filed October 15th and weren't. As long as you get them filed before the end of this month, which is rapidly approaching, uh, you will be fine. So we'll take a look at how this all works. But let's go ahead then and start looking at what's happening this week. So let's go on and take a look first at our first ruling this week, which is Chief Counsel Advice 2020. 42015. And this is a case that looks at the proper treatment of payments made when you are paying fees to participate in a daily fantasy sports program. The key question becomes, and we're going to look at, is this in fact a gambling style activity? IRC section 165D has limitations on deductions if we're involved in wagering or gambling activities. Generally, you're not allowed to, and since the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, this will always include any other expenses if you are in the business of gambling, you're not required, you're not allowed to claim deductions in excess of your income from a gambling activity. Now that's put in place primarily to uh, help us deal with the fact that they don't want to encourage gambling, shall we say. Well, the ruling here looks at a daily sports, daily fantasy sports program. These aren't like your fantasy sports leagues where you have an entire season goes on. These are much shorter term, quick programs that take place over a single day or a very short period of time. And we're looking at what happens with the program fees you put in for these very quick, short term fantasy sports programs. And the IRS has been pushing in the area of excise taxes to claim that these really represent more of a gambling activity than anything else. And they are going to extend that treatment here. So the issue comes up. You know, we're going to look at this. The IRS decided that when you pay to participate in these leagues, and these particular leagues may have things like head-to-head competitions that allow two players to challenge each other with the winner receiving the entire pool. It may have cash games that include uh, transactions with a league that identifies winners based on the best performing teams. Uh, guaranteed prize pools are games that have a set entry fee uh, to compete in a fixed prize pool, regardless of the number of entrants. 
and that 50-50 competitions involve a transaction which the top 50% of performers nearly double their returns on investment while the other half receive nothing. Now, of course, these programs are claiming that these are games of skill. But the IRS has taken the position that, in fact, it's not a contest of skill. And their position is that actually the participant in this has very, very, very little or no control over the actual outcome. They are effectively wagering for a very short-term activity on the results that they have no direct control over. So they're saying, well, that looks more like just standard gambling activities, in fact, very much like putting money on a horse race. You know, the theory being that when you bet on a horse race, which everybody has treated as gambling forever, that you're really, you know, you're kind of picking a winner in an athletic competition. Okay, it's a non-human, but it's still a winner in an athletic competition. And the IRS and the courts have ruled years ago that that's really more a game of chance because you have no specific control in that case. You aren't the horse. You don't train the horse. You don't ride the horse. You know, you're not doing any of the above. You're simply betting on which horse is going to win. So selection of team does not make it also an entrance fee. So if it's like, you know, one of those short term, very quick, like one weekend games, Uh, The fact that you selected a team is not itself either a game of skill. Rather, it's, again, a simple, quick bet on a short-term transaction. No real long-term skill issue is involved. And you're not involved in competing, so you can't really direct the outcome. The outcome outcome depends entirely on the actions of others, making it into a gambling activity. So, bottom line... The fees you pay into this can only be deducted to the extent of your gambling winnings or your winnings from the uh, fantasy sports uh, program. That means you don't have losses from the same. Next up, we have a taxpayer in the case of GM Brown et al. versus Commissioner. And this is Tax Court Memorandum Decision 2020-145. It was issued on the 19th of October of 2020. This is a taxpayer who had invested in a program that turned out to be a bit of a scam. And the catch in this was that you may remember years ago, remember Bernie Madoff? You know, Madoff, Madoff, depending on who you want to, how you pronounce that, but everybody seems to think Madoff sounds better because he kind of made off a lot of money. But Bernie, uh, you know, he went ahead and, you know, was essentially stole from all the investors that we was involved with. Now, this was the largest single Ponzi scheme that we had ever seen, period. And the IRS gave relief after there's a lot of pressure at that point to relieve, you know, give some relief this. Because traditionally, if you're to have a theft loss, and this is a theft loss of sorts, you generally don't get to claim a deduction until the year in which it's clear how much, if any, recovery you will get. So either you'll get no recovery or you've gotten the total recovery you'll receive. Obviously, for Bernie's case, this could take decades for us to figure out exactly how much is totally recoverable with all the actions and issues going on. So they issued this revenue ruling, 2009-20, and 2009-20 allowed you to claim 95% of you know of the loss that you otherwise be able to claim if you weren't pursuing third party collections so you weren't suing trying to sue a third party who might have some cash on hand so you're going to kind of live with whatever the regulatory agencies got for you but you could make that claim but they did say and the year you could claim it was not waiting until full recovery but rather was going to be in the year in which the lead party was indicted so you were to call this the year of discovery and the year of discovery is the year you claim the deduction. And the year of discovery would be the year in which the lead party was indicted. Now, there actually were a couple of other ways you might be able to get in here. For instance, if there was an investigation going on and the party died, which actually kind of came out of an Arizona case uh, where the lead party in a program committed suicide uh, just before it got started. So that, that was kind of an interesting problem. Uh, you know, that was considered a little bit, you know, that was that was also added to the list to allow that one to work. But in this case, what happened was the lead figure, the key figure, was indicted in 2010. Okay, that clearly happened. For reasons we're not told in this ruling, the taxpayers failed to claim their loss until two years later. 
Now, Revenue Procedure 2009-20 is clear. You claim it in the year of discovery, which was two years before they claimed it. General rule under the tax law is you don't get to pick and choose your year. The year, you know, there is a year you are required to claim a deduction if you are allowed a deduction and you claim it in that year. You don't get a don't get a drop it in the year of your preference. And that's where we get into a lot of problems with cases like this, because a lot of times clients are attack, you know, clients may, you know, want to claim it, I guess, more in the year which they finally admit to themselves that they really got taken and they may not want to believe that for a while. And then when they finally do believe it, you know, they've, they've now changed from, you know, being true believers and this guy's being persecuted to, oh, I guess I made a big mistake. And now I want to claim the deduction. He's not being persecuted. He actually did steal all my money. Uh, when they make that choice, that's the year they want to claim the deduction. We don't know if that was the case here, that it took them two years to finally believe that they really had been stolen from uh, or what the issue was, but they did claim it late. Now, the court said, well, guys, this is a safe harbor the IRS gave you because you aren't required to use 2009-20. You could go ahead and use the other standard rules if you want to. But the taxpayers were trying to claim, well, no, no, we should be able to use it. But here's the problem. 2009-20, we like it a lot, but it has a very, very tight specific definition of year of discovery. If you actually look at the case law and you look at the regulations and you look at the text of the code, you discover that year of discovery you know, has been held to be a little more open to interpretation as to when the proper year of discovery is. And therefore, the year when, because again, the earliest you can deduct it is year of discovery and when you have no, and then you also have no chance of recovery. You know, you kind of take care of the recovery side. So, the idea is, well, you know, we should be able to do that because we believe we can justify that 2012 meets the criteria under the case law that we find under 165. Okay, well, here's the problem the court said. Your problem in this case is simple. You are using a method where the courts, where the IRS is allowing you to claim a deduction under a safe harbor. They're not holding you to all the requirements. But there's a trade-off here. If you want to use that IRS being nice safe harbor where we don't hold you to all the strict requirements, you have to fully follow it. You can't pick and choose those areas that you're going to follow and ignore others that you feel are inconvenient. So you got two choices. You either have to do this in 2010, which almost certainly by the time this got to court and probably by the time it got examined, uh, 2010 was closed for a, for a refund claim. Either you got to claim 2010 as your year, or you need to go ahead and go through the full rule, which would hold off any deduction until you could prove that there was no, until, until the year in which there was no reasonable prospect of recovery and you had discovered the problem. Now, again, if they were right, the year of discovery could be 2012 and they could show no reasonable uh, prospect of recovery, then in theory, they, they could win at that point. But they weren't arguing that or they didn't even claim that in the case that they could show alternatively by not following this revenue procedure, they, they could show that they essentially met the requirements. And the court really didn't look at where they would have met those requirements. The court said, you can't use that. You either, you know, 2009, 20, if you're going to use it, you've got to use it in full. You don't get a pick and choose. Next up, we have in our cases, in our information this week, we have a revenue procedure. And this is the first of a pair of revenue procedures that are dealing with state unclaimed property funds that are going out there and telling employer-sponsored retirement plans that if they have a balance, and this often happens for reasons that you think people wouldn't do this, but it happens more than you would think, where an employee has left the company with a balance in the retirement plan, 401k plan, prop sharing plan, etc. And they don't actually leave any forwarding information. And the by the time, you know, when the company goes around to try to connect with them in order to say, what do you want to do with this balance in the account? Nobody can find them. So we have this balance in the account that, you know, is just, we can't catch this. Now, we all know that a plan in that case does report this, you know, kind of floating account to the IRS who tells the Social Security Administration. And there really is a program in place that when this employee finally shows up 
to apply for Social Security, he or she will be told, hey, there's this plan out here that has money for you. And at that point, the employee then turns around and goes and looks for the money. And hey, we're all, you know, it finally gets distributed. And in fact, I've had that happen even with my small clients. We actually had that happen a couple of years ago where this lost employee finally went to get Social Security, was told this balance was there, and we finally went ahead and paid him out, or the client did. So it was kind of, you know, it does work. I can tell you that for sure. Well, in this case, we're going to look at a special add-on here in the revenue procedure. This is looking at that if the funds get transferred to that uh, basically state fund. That is not that is no longer being held in a retirement fund. So the money has left a retirement fund and transferred somewhere else. Under the rules for taxing retirement funds or IRAs, when it leaves a retirement fund and ends up being held outside of either a qualified plan retirement fund or outside of an IRA, uh, it's taxable, right? It's a taxable case distribution. Well, okay, there's a distribution of cash from the plan. And in theory, we, we can fix that by putting that money into an IRA within 60 days. Well, of course, if it's going to a lost, pro you know, and basically unclaimed property fund, the odds are very, very low that the uh, participant will somehow in that 60 days magically say, hey, I should check a state unclaimed property fund and see if the money's there. Well, back in 2016, in Revenue Procedure 2016-47, the IRS created a self-certification program that allowed uh, participants in certain cases to self-certify things the IRS thought should basically would normally qualify if you ask for a private letter ruling for late rollover treatment, because the IRS has been issuing a lot of these, and they were very, very duplicative. They had never added a reason since the 2006 items originally came up. So we never had a reason added since the original relief was added back in 2016. This now will add it. If you have claimed funds from your state unclaimed property fund, you are allowed to put them back into an IRA and have it treated as if it was timely rolled over as long as you self-certify. So you can simply tell the bank or the brokerage firm, you know, sign the example document, then they updated the example document to include this as one of the one of the options for why it would work, that you find in Revenue Procedure 202046, you print that out, you sign it, you date it, and you send that in to your custodian along with your contribution, and you will then have self-certified, and that will allow you to qualify for an automatic qualified relief from the 60-day rollover rules. So we're allowed to now have that work, right? The catch is the states are starting to assert st more strongly in some cases the right to get this. That's why the IRS is coming up with this. As we'll discover, the IRS and the Department of Labor are not conceding the states have a right to do this, but this one at least gives an outfit, you know, when it happens, and you'll probably discover it happens because they're now going to issue a 1099 when they, you know, when they distribute to the state fund. That 1099 will have your ID number on it, and that will cause ACP 2000 to come out which is going to attempt to collect the money on that distribution. And at that point, you'll probably realize you have a distribution. Well, this now allows you to reclaim the funds and get the rollover done once you get that little notice from the IRS that says, hey, guys, you know what? We got a 1099 for you, a 1099 which you probably didn't even know about because, again, they don't know how to contact you. So they have no idea what address to send the 1099 to. So bottom line, yeah, it, it's a little fun, but this gives us out. The second ruling that related to this is found in Revenue Ruling 2020-24, and this one the states probably won't like for a couple of reasons. Under this revenue ruling, again, we have a qualified plan, cannot find a participant, and you know the company decides, the plan administrator decides, send it to the state unclaimed property fund. They decide that because you see state unclaimed property fund exams, and once a company goes through that, they get a bit scared about this, and the state quite often will assert if you ask them, oh, no, 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 you must turn the plan money over. It's automatic, you know, if, if it falls under the state's unclaimed property rules, right? So we want to have the money come in. Well, the IRS says, okay, if you have such a distribution, right? And we're just say, and we're going to check on this for just a second. The IRS is not going to concede that this is acceptable to make this distribution. Don't really say it's not, but not going to concede it is. You 
still must follow the federal withholding rules. Those withholding rules will override the fact the state will claim I have a right to get the whole balance. The IRS says, no, you don't. When the money leaves the retirement fund, this is a qualified rollover distribution. Part of the reason why we have the self-certification, I suspect, that this, that when you do that, that, that amount has to be withheld. And when that amount is withheld, right, so that means if, let's say, I've got an account here that has $1,000, when I transfer that to the unclaimed property fund, and normally the balances on these accounts are not going to be huge because, you know, People tend not to forget they have a half million dollars on deposit with the account. They are more apt to forget if they've got a few hundred or maybe a thousand. They're likely to neglect that. Well, when you transfer that thousand, when you when that thousand dollars is now unclaimed, instead of a thousand dollars going to the state fund, eight hundred dollars goes to the state fund, and two hundred dollars goes to the IRS to pay for withholding taxes, right? Now, the ruling goes on and tells us very clearly that they do not concede, right, or let's say it does not address, is the term they're going to use, where the payment to the state for unclaimed property otherwise complied with any other applicable law, whether that be a state law for doing the proper search in this case, or any federal laws under ERISA that, you know, are supposed to protect the employee's balance. So, you know, they're in essence setting you up saying, guys, you may want to be a little afraid of Department of Labor as well as the state unclaimed property department because I, Department of Labor may come in and claim that you had no right to transfer those funds. Yes, that puts you in a bad position, I know, but what can I say? I also think the IRS Department of Labor probably believe that this order requiring them to issue a 1099, requiring them to withhold, that that's going to make it far more likely within a year or so that that money is going to disappear from the fund. And let's be honest, why states are so aggressive about unclaimed property is not really because they want to go out there, get the stuff and find the people that have the, you know, that get this money. No, they realize that a lot of this money will never be claimed by anybody. So if the state gets that money, it becomes a kind of backdoor source of revenue. You know, that's why the state is so happy to push on this issue. This may cause them to be less apt to spend a lot of time going after this because now it's turning away from a source of funds to kind of an expense problem because they have to get the money in, record the money, and then within a year, they'll have to send the money out, process all that stuff, and they don't get to keep it. So all they've got is costs of dealing with it. So you know, maybe the states will be less inclined to do it, which would probably not actually uh, make the IRS or Department of Labor unhappy. We'll phrase it that way. One of the biggest things that happened this week is we got the draft instructions for the Form 1065. And those draft instructions include information on recording tax basis capital accounts. The required reporting for tax basis capital accounts on a partner's K-1 apparently is going to happen for 2020. These, these instructions make that fairly clear. Prior to this coming out this week, the IRS had issued some draft information about the 2020 uh, partnership returns and K-1s. But interestingly enough, they had kept the instructions for how to do capital accounts identical to the 2019 return. And you might think, well, well that, that meant they were going to skip and allow us to use any method that we'd used before. No, I mean, that we actually knew that wasn't what they're going to do. Because when I say it hadn't changed, I mean that literally. It kept saying 2019, not 2020. It specifically referred multiple times to 2019 capital accounts. So it was very obvious that, that this was not yet updated to reflect how they were going to handle this. So now we have it. We have the way for tax basis. Now, let's go back and kind of remember how this all came up. Initially, the IRS proposed going to required tax basis accounting. When that happened, a number of people, including a letter signed by all four of the big four international accounting firms, complained that there were partnerships out there that had not been reporting on tax basis. You know, they'd be using GAAP, maybe 704B uh, accounts, you know, basically book capital accounts or GAAP. And they had been reporting that way for decades. And over the decades, you know, shares had, you know, interest in the partnership had been transferred. Some had been sold. Some had been inherited. Some had been gifted. And 
some had been just, you know, issued in exchange for money to the partnership. And the problem was this had happened all through that 30, 40 years the partnership had been running. And we really didn't have records to be able to go back and reconstruct tax basis accounts going all the way back to that day, what tax basis accounting would have shown. We just knew what gap would have shown, which is probably where we really don't have any way of figuring out how to get back to tax basis really quickly. So the IRS took that into account and said, okay, we do that. And there was a secondary complaint that said, and anyway, people do tax basis accounting different ways. So it's not really consistent because it never really mattered that much and nobody cared. But now you're going to require us to report this way and tell if they have negatives. And obviously we have to know what that means. So the IRS reconsidered, and last year they said, okay, you can keep reporting whatever way you want to. You do still have to tell us if there's negative tax basis capital, which I thought was interesting, meaning that in theory, we still need to know what tax basis capital was, but ignore that problem. So the IRS early this year decided, okay, we're going to solve this problem. You guys tell us that we can't compute tax basis capital and doing it on a transactional basis, which is how we normally handle partnership capital in whatever method you're using, right? We just look at, we start out with, you know, what happens transactionally. Somebody puts money in that adds to their capital account. Somebody takes money out, it reduces it. You know, the, the partnership makes money. You know, we add to capital. The partnership loses money. We reduce capital, right? So it's all transactional. And we do it on different bases, but, you know, but it's just a transactional thing. But you've told us that there's no way, you know, transactionally, it's all fouled up with tax bases. And, you know, anyway, there, there's no way we, we couldn't possibly compute the proper tax basis capital for our partnerships. So the IRS said, okay, we're going to say, instead of actually doing a transactional approach, we're going to go ahead and compute beginning and ending capital using one of two methods. And so everybody will compute either by taking partner's capital from the, or I should say the partner's basis in their capital account, and you get that from every partner, and then we'll just kind of keep running, computing their basis every year and use that as capital. So their outside basis is what we use with some adjustments, or we're going to go back and do what we do normally to compute the inside basis for purposes of the uh, 743B adjustments. If there's a 74 election in place, you know, where we go back and try to figure out, because you're going to make a 743B adjustment, 74 election, you know, we had to figure out, okay, th th this guy bought the partnership for $20,000. We're going to adjust as if the, you know, the base of assets inside, his share basis of assets inside equals what he has is outside basis. So we have to know what his share of inside basis is. And there's a computation for doing that with a deemed sale of all partnership assets for fair value. We figure out how much cash our new partner would get if there was such a sale that took place today, immediately after he purchased. Uh, then we take a look at what was well, his K-1, what gains or losses would be generated by that sale and go to his K-1. And then we just take his cash he would get, subtract out any gains that would show up on that K-1, add back any losses, and voila, that's his, ba that's his share of inside basis. Since we have that computation, we'll just use that to compute the partner's basis. And so we will do that deemed sale at the beginning and end of the year. And we'll do that for each partner to figure out what their basis is, what their tax basis capital is. So they proposed that this year. Then they got complaints from a larger number of people who said, wait, we have been doing tax basis capital ever since the partnership started. And in fact, a majority of partnerships that file, file tax basis capital accounts. And they're saying, why should we be penalized because these large partnerships that had these gap financial statements haven't bothered to keep these records during the life of their partnership? Why should we have to do a special calculation every year that's in addition to what we normally do when we already got this right for the most part? And they're saying, you know, and they say, you know, you guys could then define terms, but really we've got this right. And it's not that wildly off compared from how people, different people did it. So really IRS, you know, we should be able to do transactional. So the IRS has come back and kind of got a split the middle answer. So that's what came up with in the instructions. Okay. So first thing they tell us is how do you record tax basis? Well, they say generally you're going to record any transaction. And by the way, the IRS will require transactional accounting. Now, 
we're going to have a relief provision for a partnership that had not been going on tax basis. So if you're one of those people, like with the big four, screaming and yelling, wait, 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 there's no way we can't possibly compute beginning partners, tax basis capital. There's no way this. Calm down. They're going to have a fix for you. Okay. I mean, you may not like the fix, but they're going to have a fix for you. Okay. But anyway, once we get beginning capital, and we'll tell you how you're going to get beginning capital if you are with a partnership that's never reported tax basis. We will let you know how to compute that. Then we're going to just kind of report items using however they basically, on the basis used to the extent they would affect a partner's basis in their partnership interest. That's how you're going to record it. That's how you impact tax basis capital. So it's going to basically follow that if you're not sure how to do it. Right. Now, again, you must use tax basis reporting, as I said, reporting consistently. So if a taxpayer, if a taxpayer had been reporting on the tax basis of a, or on the, yeah, on basically on the tax basis uh, for his capital accounts on the K-1s, you're going to report beginning capital, just pick up last year's numbers, right? If you were checking the box that said reporting capital on the tax basis, then last year's numbers, what you use? start with the capital account you had before. Now, if you decide, because now you know what they're worried about, right? If that's negative, they're going to start asking people questions, especially if you've got distributions, and they're not claiming gains. You know, they're going to ask them to take a look at that negative capital. They're going to then take a look at the how much in liabilities were allocated to them. And they're going to figure out also deemed distributions of liabilities. And they'll start asking, shouldn't you have had a gain? You know, based on that. Yes, that's how they're going to plan to use it. There's no question. So if you do suddenly this year go back and, oh, we made mistakes in the past, we've recomputed them, and somebody who on last year's return, on the 19 return, showed a negative ending capital account on tax basis, this year shows positive, you have to attach an explanation telling me what's, how, how, why, why, how do you get there? How do you move from negative to positive? What's the explanation for that? You have to do that. So yeah, if you're going to be making those changes, don't be surprised. Then they tell us about, you know, the various lines we have in that computation on on the set, on box L, right, for this. They tell us how to compute contributions are going to be on the taxpayer's basis of the partner who contributes. So obviously, if they contribute cash, cash has basis equal to the amount of cash. If they contribute property, we're going to put their basis in the property. Now, if they contribute property secured by a debt, if that debt has is a balance that is greater than the partner's basis, you know, in the property, then the contribution could be negative. They're saying that's that's perfectly okay. You can have negative contributions of capital. Now you got to be careful here because there is a computation you're gonna make here to figure out if there's if there is a true net negative contribution of capital. That's not covered by the allocation of debt coming to the partner. Uh, you have a distribution. You may have a gain in that situation. So, yeah, negative negative capital contributions. That could be a bad thing. Might get a question from the IRS. But legitimately, it should be negative. They're saying, yeah, it can be negative. Don't, don't move it anywhere else. If there is a debt related to an asset that was contributed to the partnership and the you know, liability is in, the liability is in excess of the basis, then you have a negative contribution. And if you don't contribute cash or something else to bring us up to a net positive, then you have to show it as negative. And yes, that might attract attention. Just going to warn you ahead of time. That may not be taxable, but it still may have the IRS wanting to explain why it's not. You know, and Sage just wants some explaining. Now, there's an interesting thing. The other decrease and increase column, I tell you about those are things that aren't really, you know, going through the main part of the return. And they talk about some examples of things that should be in the other increase and other decrease category. And one of the things they tell us that should be in the other increase or other decrease category is they essentially tell us that in this case, what should go in there? Well, we talk about current year's net income or loss. That should be just, you know, on the tax basis. No problem. We know what that is. And it probably is going to agree with your Schedule K total income number. Other things go there. It could include your share of excess of tax deductions for depletion other than oil and gas over the adjusted basis of property. That would be an increase. Or it could be your a share of any increase to adjusted tax basis of partnership property under 734B. 
734B is the adjustment that takes place if you have an election under 754 in place and the partnership does something. Most often, you'll see this arise in the context of the partnership is buying an existing partner. Likelihood is they're going to pay fair value for that. And there's a good likelihood that when they pay that, the amount they're going to pay is going to be more than the partner's basis, or at least not equal to the partner's net basis inside. So there'll be a positive or negative that kind of gets involved in that. Well, what they're saying is, essentially, that 743B adjustment, whether it's positive or negative, when that happens, that goes in the other increase-decrease. Now, what you probably normally think about as a 74 adjustment is when an outsider buys a partnership interest or inherits a partnership interest from an existing partnership. The IRS makes it very clear that should never, that adjustment to basis should never be included in tax basis capital on the partner's K-1. This is probably one of the biggest things. I'm sure people raise this as an example because I know there have been accountants that have, you know, come to me and they want to book that, right? They want to book that. What the IRS is saying is you should book that 734. Why? Because that affects every partner who remains in the partnership. So that makes sense to view it as a partnership level item. But 743 only affects the one partner. And because it only affects the one partner, they don't want that into tax basis capital. Yes, it impacts the basis of a partner's interest, but that's, we don't care. That's a tax basis issue. And why do they want it separate? I'll tell you the reason I believe they want it separate. They want you to demonstrate the partner has to be able to show a justification for, you know, what did you put in? What did you pay? How was that in excess of the inside base at that time? That is a question with them and the partner to work out. So they want to know it and they just need to work it out there. For 734, they can work that one out at the partnership level, but they don't want to have to chew up the partnership time for a single thing. So basically, they want that out of there and part of the basis adjustment, part of the calculation of partner's basis, so they know that that's something to go after the partner when the partner claims he has basis. They can go after that and go differently. So basically, you include your 734 adjustments. You do not include 743. If you already had 743 items in Partners Capital to start the year, we said you still start with last year's tax basis. You will still do that. But this year, you will take the 743s off the balance sheet, and you will run that as a negative other decrease or other increase, if it goes the other way, on the K-1. So basically, those go that direction. Right. Distributions can also be negative, just like contributions. Remember, we had that issue. So, again, if you distribute a piece of property that had a liability that the partner took on that was greater than the basis to the partnership of the item distributed, you would also record that as a negative item. Now, the interesting part there, I suppose, theoretically, the IRS may take a look there in certain cases to see if there's some sort of disguised sale going on as opposed to a distribution conceivably they might. I don't think I'll look at that one nearly as often. Now, the they also make very clear that Schedule M2 is on the tax basis. So Schedule M2, when you start for, you know, when you're going to reconcile capital and net income, that is always done on tax basis, regardless of how your Schedule L balance sheet is on the tax return. The Schedule L balance sheet can still remain on another basis of accounting. So you still can have your Schedule L balance sheet uh, on gap basis or on for 704b capital account basis that's still allowed but the but schedule m2 will always 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 be tax basis right they don't want it on any other basis of accounting now the question again has become okay we're back to that problem though the first time they had no we've got these partnerships like the big four complained about you know they've been operating for years our gap basis and you know we, we, we have never, you know, we, we don't have any information regarding, you know, how to get to tax basis capital. We simply don't know how tax basis capital would be computed. We can't go back and get it. It's impossible. Okay, let's talk then about those partnerships that have previously been porting on a basis other than tax basis. What do they use for beginning capital? They do not use what was on last year's return. Rather, because that'll be on another basis of accounting. 
if they have a tax basis computation, because that's possible, right? We may very well have kept a tax basis computation because supposedly we should have one because last year we had to know if it's negative. So we might have one. If you have one, yeah, you can just swap to it. Don't worry, you're fine. That's the easiest fix. But the IRS comes up and says, if you don't, if you can't easily switch that way, then we have three methods. Now, one of them, is, two of them are the ones they proposed earlier in the year. That is, one method to use would be the modified outside basis method. You ask each partner to give you the copy of their basis that they had as of the end of last year. The partner tells you the basis they've computed for their interest at the end of last year. You take that basis and essentially you remove from that basis a couple of adjustments, right? The big one being taking their, li their share of liabilities out of it because that should be part of their basis. And that will give you their capital account for the beginning of the year. That is the only thing you use that for. We never use this computation again. But that gives us a starting point. All adjustments to that will be from the tax return using the tax basis numbers. We will not compute that every year like was implied in this ruling earlier. So we're just going to do it once. The other method we proposed this summer is also in there. That was the modified previously tax capital method. That was a method we discussed earlier where we have a deemed sale. Now, it should be at fair market value, but in reality, they said, we understand you might not have fair market value. And if you don't have fair market value, you know, we understand since you might not have fair market value in your computations, uh, you know, we'll go ahead and we'll let you use some other method. That, that could be various methods that are allowed, including simply your gap uh, you know, whatever the gap values are in book value, it could be, uh, you know, some other value that's meant for liquidation. It could be the partnership could estimate things, whatever method you want to use, because here its position is it's going to kind of work out. Now, there is a requirement here. It, whatever method, and I, and I should say, let's go, there's a fourth method as well. You could also use, if you have, you can start with 704B capital accounts, which by the way, you know, almost every partnership agreement we have out there says that we are keeping 704B capital accounts because they're required, right, if for us to defend special allocations for the most part. Well, if you have those, you'll start with those. You remove the 704C adjustments, which are the, you know, the differences in basis and fair value when you contribute to property to the partnership. And you'll just use that as your starting point. Okay. And, you know, and there's no need to worry about uh, liabilities for that one because they don't matter. Now, if you use these, if you're going, if you're previously not on the tax basis, you do have to, on this year's K-1, tell the partner how you arrived at beginning capital. Did you use the tax basis that you previously calculated? Did you use the modified outside basis method? Did you use the modified previously tax capital method? And did you use the 704B method? And if you use the modified previously tax capital method, you must tell the IRS uh, and the tax, you must tell the partner and the IRS which one of these sales methods, how you count with your deemed sales price. You have to use the same method for every partner. So you can't use like, you know, tax basis method if they have it, but if they don't, then you know, say or say modified outside basis me method if they have a basis, but a partner that doesn't. Well, for that one, then we we'll use 704B method. No, that's not going to work. You've got to use the same method for everybody. So if all the partners don't have basis numbers for you, then you're going to be using either the modified previously tax capital method, the 704B method, or if you've already got tax basis capital accounts, just use those. Now, you may say, but I might still not be able to compute this. I could be wrong. It's horrible. They say, we're going to issue a notice that's going to specifically provide that as long as you use, uh, and I guess, what was the term they have? It's in their news release. And I, so I want to go find that right now so I give you the, the correct one. You know, we will not impose penalties for errors in computing the beginning capital accounts if the partnership takes ordinary and prudent business care in following the form instructions to calculate and report the beginning capital account balances. So if you take these instructions and use reasonable and prudent business care, and I know you're going to wor worry, what does that mean? Well, I don't know for sure, but we're going to hope we get an explanation later. As long as, you, as long as you do that, and hopefully the notice will tell us, uh, we're not going to penalize you this year. I think realistically, the IRS doesn't care much about that, how you get there, as long as you're halfway reasonable in doing it. They just want to get you started recording this way, because what's going to happen over time is these old partner accounts are going to disappear. 
if somebody contributes cash to the partnership, they're going to start out on the true uh, tax basis, right? That's how we'll do it. So eventually, we're going to kind of get there, right? And old partnerships will go away, new partnerships will come up. So over time, we're going to, you know, these weird out of whack capital accounts that we're going to start with this year are going to over time become a smaller and smaller portion of the number of accounts out there. And the IRS realizes already most are on the tax basis. So they're going to get their tax basis capital and they're basically saying, and you guys who complain you can't do it, we're going to give you these methods to just come up with a number. We're not picky about the number too much, but you're going to start with it. And then after that, you're going to do it this way. And don't tell us you can't do that because that's required for you to actually do all the K-1s. So if you're going to whine about not being able to do that, it's like, just stop whining. We're, we're not buying the story anymore. So in any event, the IRS requires this. I would suggest that if you have been using non-tax basis capital accounts, that you, you know, might want to start working some of those up before tax season starts because, hey, it won't be that, that tough to do at this point. And the other thing to be aware of is if you have been putting 743 adjustments, right, the ones that apply to the single partner who bought an interest or inherited an interest for another partner, you've actually been booking that on the books, which you might have done to make reporting a little bit easier in some cases, you know, so you just compute the depreciation or something and have it just kind of flow straight on. It would go straight to the balance sheet. You'd feel good. Uh, you need to start working up those adjustments, too, because remember, you got to pull that off this year. Uh, you'll still report the adjustment number on the K-1 because nothing's saying here, don't report the number, but you're going to have to remove it from the balance sheet. And those adjustments will not affect tax basis capital. 734 adjustments will, 743 adjustments will not. So yeah, you got to worry about that. Next up, this is a case, and I don't know if I want to say it's good news or bad news because whether you consider this a good ruling or a bad ruling depends primarily which side of the situation you end up on. Are you, the, are you the CPA who's charged with having, let's say, done something that caused the client harm? Or are you the CPA who, when the previous CPA apparently did something that the client believed caused them harm, took over and represented them before the IRS tried to get them out of the penalties? Because if in the first category, you probably won't like this rule, this particular court case. If you're in the second category, you probably will. So th this is the GOE case. I love it. However you spell that, this one. And again, there's a whole series of them. There's a whole series of them to the accounting firms named and then the specific accountants, etc. But it's a case from the U.S. District Court for the District of Rhode Island. The case number is CA18-263-JJM-PAS. It was released on the 29th of September. And what happened in this case when you read it? A CPA firm, uh, basically a CPA, there was a very complex return the CPA had to deal with. And the CPA for you know was unable to finish the return by October 15th. Now, part of the reason is it was very complicated. He was trying to figure out how to report. And he didn't get some information that was going to be ultimately important, at least in final form, by October 15th. Now, apparently at that date, he told the partner, or I should say told the client, that he was going to be subjected to penalties, and those penalties would be six figures, okay? Um, fine. Well, it turns out that he finally got the information. It related to some information that he needed to receive from, a, from an entity that he was involved in. He finally got, or I should say, the Swiss tax return because the, the taxpayer lived in Switzerland. Uh, he finally got that somewhere around Dece right just after December 15th. And, you know, but he fi didn't finally get around to getting the return done until, as we recall, somewhere around the end of February. Okay. Obviously, the IRS assessed him for like five month late payment penalty. That's like 25%, right? Remember, close to be over 25%. It'll be 20% of tax due, except it's reduced by the half a percent each month. You know, that weird calculation. But in essence, lots of money was due because this had not been timely filed. And way more was due than if it had been timely filed, but just hadn't been paid. So we had that. Now, the other problem that this firm did that we discover when we read the case is. There is a special rule, and you can read the IRS publication, that if a taxpayer is out of the country, when October 15th rolls around, you actually have a right to send in another 4868 with an explanation and ask the IRS for up to two months more extra time to file the return. And it tells you specifically the IRS won't write back to you 
unless they decide to deny you. So it's not an automatic extension, but it's fairly automatic. Now, what happened in this case was the taxpayer appears to have hired and decided that the law firm that he talked about, talked to for tax issues, should handle this IRS, you know, dispute, trying to get out of the penalty. I, you know, we, we can assume it may be because they lost confidence in the CPA firm, which very well could happen in this case. But in any event, so the CPA wasn't able to defend in this case. Rather, the law firm did. Now, the law firm did bring up that, you know, he could have gotten a two-month extension. So realistically, two months of the penalty shouldn't apply. The IRS asked the law firm, are you asking us to grant a retroactive two-month extension? Because, they, you know, so was it asked for? Said no. Said, so are you asking us to do a retroactive? Well, they didn't respond to that. My guess they didn't respond because that sort of question tells you almost automatically if you try to ask for it, they're going to say right back, nope. You know, you have to ask for it on time. So whatever, they, they kind of decided it wouldn't go. They did, however, get the IRS to back down some on the penalty. So the penalty was reduced, but still there was a penalty. The client sues the CPA firm for the penalty. Now, the IR, you know, in essence, the taxpayer said, or the CPA firm said, hey, wait a minute, you didn't pursue in full the defense about getting the two-month extension. If you had, that would have gotten rid of, you know, two of the five months, so 40% of the penalty would have disappeared. So we think that our exposure to having to pay the client for any damages that might be involved, and we're not admitting that we owe those damages, and by the way, the court didn't rule on that issue yet, but we should be able to reduce our, our potential exposure by the fact that, you know, the amount of the penalty would have been less had you actually pursued this, you know, relief option that you abandoned. Well, the court found that it might be possible for a CPA firm in a case like this, for the original preparer, to use this defense that, that the new representative fouled up in the representation. But he said it's not going to be easy. And the court said we're not going to second guess the representative who got when the representative got a reduction. The issue here becomes that if you do have damages, if I'm damaged by you, I have to take reasonable steps to mitigate the damages. I can't just let the damages go uncontested, you know, pay huge amounts, take no steps to mitigate damages, and then have you have to pay the whole thing. Let's talk about an example. Let's say that, that you know, let, let's say that the, you own, you own a, you know, let's say you own a rental property, this condominium unit, and you own an upstairs unit, right? And it turns out that, you know, there, there is a water leak in your upstairs unit that you weren't aware of, and it begins to damage the unit below your unit. Okay, it like seeps through, damages, you know, and begins coming through. Well, okay, you're liable for that damage. There's no question. However, you know, the, the party downstairs, the damage party, is not allowed, though, to ignore it for like three years, at which time it's getting worse, 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 worse. And then after it's like wiped out a huge chunk of drywall, ceiling, and everything else, then come after you for the repairs for the whole thing. Because the problem is they were required to take steps to mitigate damages. And basically, so when they saw the problem, they should have notified you of the problem instead of ignoring it for like, you know, two, three years, letting it get really bad. And then suddenly saying, oh, there's this problem I haven't told you about for three years. It's damaged my unit. And because it damaged my unit, you should pay for the whole repair all along. No, in that case, you would be liable only for the amount of the cost of the initial repair had it been done immediately, rather than the cost of the repair all the way through. Same thing here. But the court's saying, no, in this case, the client took reasonable steps, got an attorney, and while it might be possible if the attorney had truly just totally fouled up, but if the attorney tries something reasonable, I think the way the court kind of looks at it is based on Rhode Island law. But the way the court looked at it was, if you had done anything, you know, you have to be doing something so unreasonable that, that basically the client should have figured out that that wasn't a reasonable defense. They got a reduction. They did what they were uh, appointed to do. The client basically shouldn't be penalized just because maybe, and neither should the law firm be penalized, because maybe if they had pursued this other option, you know, that maybe they might have gotten a different result. Well, that, that second guessing could help it anywhere. The court's not going to second guess. So the CPA firm was told, nope, we're going to keep the amount of damages claimed the same, 
and you're going to have to defend against whether you're liable for that. We're not going to let you escape partial damages you would otherwise be liable for by claiming that the law firm should have got them reduced further. Next up, we have in our final issue for this week. It's gone on for a while. We have a kind of funny issue that came up late in the week. Uh, and your client, if they forgot to file their FinCEN report, you know, their FBAR report. They have a few more days to do it now. What happened in this case is was the FinCEN clarifies FBAR extensions, and that's on the FinCEN website, was posted on October the 16th. And what happened in this case was that the IRS, or I should say, the FinCEN posted a misleading statement on the BSA, Bank Secrecy Act, e-filing webpage. You know, the one where if you're, going to, if you're not filing using your tax software and you're filing using like that PDF method or directly online with the FinCEN, which you can do, you know, it had various notes about things. And one of its notes it had was that it talked about a extension of time to file the FinCEN this year to December 31st. Now, they were trying to be helpful. They posted this on October 15, 14th. They were trying to be helpful because they had a notice posted October 6th that did grant an extension. But there was a problem. That extension was only for those impacted by, a, by certain disasters that had happened recently. That would include like the major storm in Iowa, you know, certain other things that had happened. So there was a limited category of people who have until the end of December to file this form. But they left that little detail off on this thing that went on the form the day before. Realizing that some people may have seen it there on the 14th and said, you know, I, I, I'm safe. I, I, I can delay. I can procrastinate two more weeks. You know, I could procrastinate, I should say, two and a half more months. So, you know, I can ignore it, right? I can get all the way to December 31st. So I can ignore this again. Uh, you know, they might have done that and not check back in the next day when they, when they put a correction notice up. So what FinCEN has decided to do, they said, look, due to the confusion we created, we're going to go ahead and accept forms as long as they are filed by October the 31st. So as long as you have your forms to us by October 31st, the FinCEN forms are filed online electronically by October 31st. They will be timely even if you're not in one of these disaster areas. If you're in a disaster area, you still got till December 31st. Okay, and disaster does not mean COVID. I think a lot of reason they also decide to do this is because this year with COVID, you know, we've seen a lot of these extensions. So it's probably not like clients should wonder or somebody should wonder, you're like, I wonder why I got an extension. It's like all kinds of things got extended this year. So yeah, no, this was not a last minute COVID extension. So, you know, but you do have a few more days. If you're listening to this before Halloween, you have a few more days to get this filed. You have until Halloween to get it in. Okay. Now, like I said, we do have a few courses coming up here. Let me get this correct. Uh, with Ido Society, I'll be doing a webinar on October the 29th and for preparing complex 1040s on October the 30th for fringe benefits for 2020. You can sign up on the Idaho Society website, HTTPS, uh, basically idcpa.org is where you'll find it. Make it that easier. Make that simpler. I'm also having on the 4th to the 6th of November, I will be doing sessions, one on the 4th, one on the 6th as part of the Arizona Federal Tax Institute, be a federal tax update, and then COVID-19 related tax issues update for the society on that date. And because the magic of virtual, at the same time, I will be doing sessions at the Pacific Tax Institute. And that runs, which for the Washington side of CPAs, that runs on the 5th and 6th of November. And I'll be doing sessions on the 6th. Nice sessions there on the 6th will be the CARES Act impact on net operating losses and taxation of debt forgiveness. So we'll have those, and those can be signed up for the Washington Society website. The Arizona Federal Tax Institute can be signed up on the Arizona Society website. So sign up. CPE is happening now. Get ready. New fun times. Okay, this has been the Current Federal Tax Developments for this week. Hey, almost an hour this time, so hopefully we'll keep it shorter next week. You can email me at edzollers at currentfelttaxdevelopments.com. you have any questions or issues, my Twitter handle, at edzollers. I do follow the Connect sites for the, follow for the state societies in Arizona, Illinois, Minnesota, New Jersey, and Washington. So if you participate there, you're a member there, you go ahead and post on there. And we'll talk, you know, if you have issues and I, I see questions that I think I can help with, I'll try to post there. Uh, to help you on those things. Uh, otherwise, you know, we're looking. Now, we still have the threat, though probably not very likely at this point. We're going to wait too close to the election uh, to have some sort of, you know, COVID-19 relief bill that passes through. 
I think the chances of that are becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. It seems highly unlikely. We are way too close to Election Day at this point for me to see the Congress getting it through and passed before that day. I think at this point, we're likely at best seeing it in a lame duck session of the Congress that may occur after the election. But, you know, if it does happen, though, we will tell you about it and we'll talk about what's going on. But otherwise, I I think we're kind of waiting for the election now to see what's going to happen. But we probably still will have developments. You know, the IRS is publishing things. We're getting things happening. So things are going on. So we'll be back here next week and hopefully you'll make your way back here. And we'll see you here on the federal tax developments for next week. The first one for the for the month of no. Well, let's see. Yeah, we'll be the first one for the month of November. And it'll be the day before Election Day segment. So we'll talk about that. And who knows, the week after that, we'll see what we do. Four years ago, the week after that, I talked about uh, the president elects tax bills. Uh, proposed. Obviously, if we do appear to have, if we have a change of president or we appear we're going to have a change of president, then I might do the same thing this year uh, to talk about proposed changes. If not, we'll just keep it with the standard requirements again. Um, you know, probably not going to spend much time on proposals, you know, if the current president stays in place because, hey, you know, that you just wait for. But people get really worried about new presidents or excited, worried, whatever they're going to be about what new presidents do. So, Then we might do that again just like four years ago if there is a change. But again, if there's no change, we'll be just doing updates like normal. So, you know, get ready for that. But we'll see you then. So have a good week. Hopefully you're having a good time and uh, enjoy your Halloween. And we'll see you next week on Current Federal Tax Developments.